All right, everyone, I think it's uh, noon. Let's start this uh, number one out of a speaker series brought to you by Go Learn at the University of Utah. Go Learn, me first. I'm Christoph Dressler, I'm directing Go Learn, and we are the U's faculty led travel program. Anyone can join, but uh, basically, we're taking the classroom on the road and we have faculty leading our trips all over the world, but some also domestic. Uh, Stephen, for instance, right here, Stephen um, guided a trip to, for us, a writing and photography trip up to Centennial Valley, to the Tafts Nicholson Center. Um, a shout out to the College of Humanities who are running their programs up there, um, it, which is a fantastic place. Um, again, way off the beaten path. Similar to, well, what we're gonna talk about today, um, Stephen's book. Um, a shout out to everyone out there. We got way, we're getting into 80 participants now. Um, so I'm hoping um, some of our viewers are alumni. So welcome. Uh, this is also brought to you by the Alumni Association here at the U, for which GoLearn is the travel provider. And we're so excited to have alumni and non-alumni join us here today with Stephen Trimble to talk about his book. Um, like I said, GoLearn cannot go travel right now. So we decided to bring the road to you instead of us hitting the road as a group. Um, number one of our speaker series is today, Stephen Trimble. Um, we will have every Thursday a speaker here at Go Learn at noon. So join us this Thursday coming up um, with Tim Slover and Jane England uh, exploring London. But now um, let's explore one of the places that are really near and dear to me. I did the math, Stephen, 15 years ago. I proposed to my wife on the upper mule twist at a backpacking trip overlooking the water pocket fold. I'm getting goosebumps because it's such a special place. Uh, people drive by to visit the Utah National Monument, I mean, Utah National Parks, five of them, and sometimes we forget about the Capitol Reef, but it's uh, super special, and this book is a gem, everyone. Um, the Utah Press uh, brought this out, I think, last year, Stephen? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, a collection of stories of facts. Um, there's something in this for everyone. If you're a lover of Utah, go get this book. If you are a um, fan of maps, of facts, of historical facts, of history, of Utah's history, um, so much more in this reader. So without further ado, Stephen Trimble uh, will present today uh, about this book. We will take questions through the chat. So you can always um, run a few questions by us and we will uh, monitor, monitor um, these. And when we're done with our webinar, we will get to your questions and hopefully we get to all of them. But if we don't, uh, we'll pick out the most interesting ones and Stephen uh, can answer them. So here he is. Thank you very much for joining us today for GoLearn Speaker Series here from the University of Utah. Stephen Trimble down in Torrey, welcome. Thank you, Christoph. And thanks to all of you for tuning in on our very first of these webinars. You know, we can't, can't really travel right now during the pandemic, so we are doing our best to take you to very cool places virtually. And today we're going to go to Capitol Reef National Park. Uh, I have to say my experience with Go Learn has been wonderful. I spent three different uh, Go Learn expeditions, you might call them, up at the, the Centennial Valley Field Station in Montana with wonderful groups of people talking about writing and photography and learning from the land and responding to the land creatively. Uh, we haven't been able to run that trip for several years, but we have hopes of running it again, maybe down here in Southern Utah, where I am right now at our home in Torrey. So I'm going to take the screen off of me and let you look at my photographs all the way through the talk. And then at the end, I'll come back on and uh, you'll be able to see me when we talk about questions. So I'm gonna do my best to make the share screen work now. Let's see if we've got all this figured out. And I will stop the video so that you see only the glorious photographs on your screen. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're up to. So here's the cover of the book that Christoph was holding up, The Capital Reef Reader. The University of Utah Press has been publishing a series of national park readers, anthologies of the very best writing about Western national parks. 
The press has done Rocky Mountain National Park and Glacier and Zion and Grand Canyon and many other parks are in the works. Probably the next book after mine to come out will be Arches. And I also need to thank the press for just simply publishing this Park Reader series. When the general editors of the series, Dave Stanley and Lance Newman, asked me if I would edit the Capitol Reef volume, of course I said yes. I was not going to let anybody else snag this book. Thanks to Dave Livermore in the Nature Conservancy of Utah as well, who provided us with a grant to run color photographs throughout the book. The Capitol Reef Reader gathers 160 years worth of words that capture the spirit of the park and its surrounding landscape in personal narratives, philosophical riffs, and historic and scientific records. I chose these pieces for the character of their storytelling and language while I looked for an array of writing that reveals Capitol Reef in all its layers, from geology to history, from native peoples to 21st century canyoneers. I found pieces that are a pleasure to read and authors who tell us better than anyone else about some aspect of Capitol Reef. The reader also includes 100 photos, and you'll see most of them today. Nearly all of these are my pictures from decades of hiking and photographing here, plus a selection of historic black and whites and a handful from other photographers. So why was I so intent on editing this book? Remember that ad campaign during the centennial of the National Park Service back in 2016, Find Your Park? This is my park. And so this was a labor of love. I first arrived in Capitol Reef in 1975 to work a season for the National Park Service as a ranger, knowing only a little. I was 24. I'd worked as a park ranger briefly at Arches and for a season in Colorado. I'd published my first little book for Park Natural History Associations, but I was a newcomer to all things Capitol Reef. This was a long time ago when I first went out camping that summer I was still sleeping on top of picnic tables because I was afraid of scorpions. Living in Fruta under the big red cliff, which is what we called, called it, uh, every night I would watch for the deer to come off the mesa. The mule deer would come down and I kept missing him with my camera every night. They'd come down after dark. They'd come down when I didn't have my camera with me. And there was this one night finally when these three bucks came down off the mesa to spend the evening in the orchards, and I raced back from where I was playing volleyball with my buddies on the Park Service staff and grabbed my camera and, and was able to photograph the deer and make a series of pictures I've been publishing ever since. I was hired as a seasonal in part to write and photograph for the park. I wrote and photographed a general interpretive book for the Natural History Association, emphasizing the backcountry, and I wrote and took pictures for a Hickman Bridge trail guide both publications long out of print. And whenever I do this reading in bookstores, just for fun, I pass those books around. I can't do that with you today, so these are the covers of these long out of print books that were really part of my apprenticeship that I served as a writer and photographer, publishing these little books with National Park Natural History Associations. Note the price on the trail guide. That was a 32 page booklet that we sold for 25 cents. But when I write, I research too. So nearly 45 years ago, I began reading everything I could find about Capitol Reef, and I've never stopped. I'm endlessly intrigued with the unending challenge of responding to this place in language and capturing Capitol Reef in words. There are more than 50 excerpts in the Capitol Reef Reader. I don't expect you to start at page one and read on right through to the end. You'll flip through and read what catches your eye, what interests you. So I thought I'd organize my reading for you in the same way. So picture yourself flipping, th flipping through the book, and let's say this picture brings you to a halt. It might, especially if you've seen the great movie from the 1960s, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and you know that Butch Cassidy was a, a renegade outlaw and his wild bunch hanging out at Robber's Roost over by Canyonlands, uh, Butch was actually born in Circleville, over west of Capitol Reef, and rode through the park many times. And this signature is on the back of the Behunan cabin, that little cabin right on Highway 24 that takes you right through the park. 
Uh, the cabin was built in 1883 by Elijah Cutler Behunin and his wife, Tabitha Jane, as home for their 13 children. And they spent only one year there in that one room cabin and, and sleeping in dugouts around it. Uh, and then came back occasionally after that. But they were there when Butch came through. And I have a piece of writing in the, the reader written by their, the granddaughter of this family who reached back and told the story of Butch stopping for a visit and Tabitha Jane made him lunch. And he went around to the back of the cabin and carved his name in the rocks in the, the sandstone blocks that the cabin is made out of. The, uh, the signature was plastered over in the 1990s by the Park Service, perhaps to protect it, perhaps because they weren't quite sure of its authenticity. But when I was a ranger at Capitol Reef, one day an old timer came into the visitor center and told us that he was with Butch when he carved his name in those rocks. So there may not be absolute proof, but I believe that it's true. As I read about the park, I learned this was also an important place for native people. Archaeologists came in the 1920s and named the prehistoric Fremont culture for our local river, the Fremont. Paiute, Ute, and Navajo people had lived here and ancestral Pueblo people, the ancestors of today's Hopi and Zuni people as well. The Hopi and Zuni came through and left rock art testimony to their passage. Well, I looked long and, and far and wide for first person stories from native people about the relationship with the park and they just aren't out there. The best source we have is a wonderful compendium put together by a Park Service cultural anthropologist, Rosemary Sousa, who went out in the 1980s and interviewed native people in all of the tribes associated with the park. And so in the reader, I depend on Rosemary's stories. For prehistoric people, I had to rely on archeologists and writers like Rose Houck, who wrote about her hikes in the park, encountering rock art, as she described one of the finest outdoor galleries in the world in a canyon of imaginings. But the very best story about native people in Capitol Reef has to do with these three spectacular anomalous rawhide shields discovered by Ephraim Portman Pechtol, the man in the middle, with his lovely daughters, Golda and Devona, in this picture. When I was a ranger at Capitol Reef in the 70s, these shields were still on display in the Park Visitor Center. And I knew they had a fascinating story then, and their journey since is even more astonishing. In the reader, historian Bob McPherson takes us through the twists and turns of the story of these shields, gradually taking them right back to the people who made them. This remains the pivotal gesture of respect toward native culture at Capitol Reef. And I wanna tell you that story in a little bit more detail. So Bishop Pechtol lived in Torrey. He ran the general store that became the Chuck Wagon, the current general store in Torrey. And in those days, back in the 1920s, it wasn't really frowned upon to go out and dig around in ruins and look for artifacts. And the bishop did that often and brought his amazing finds back to his little museum upstairs at his general store. But the most amazing find he ever made in 1926 were these three shields, which were unlike anything that he or the locals or the archeologists had ever seen. Uh, Bishop Pechtel believed that the three shields proved some of the stories in the Book of Mormon. And for a while they were on display at the Visitor Center and Museum on Temple Square in Salt Lake City. But eventually they made their way back to the Visitor Center, the new Visitor Center at Capitol Reef built in the 60s, where I saw them when I was a ranger. And the archeologists couldn't really make sense of them. They didn't know how old they were. They didn't know if they were made by the Fremont in prehistoric times or maybe by more historic Ute people. They were a puzzle. And then along came the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act in 1990. And we began to move these sacred objects out of museum collections and repatriate them back to the people who made them. And in the late 90s, some Native folks came through Capitol Reef and said, some of these things you've got here need to come, come back to us. Uh, the Zuni people were the first to say that. And so the park invited each of the tribes associated with Capitol Reef to make a claim and say whether or not they thought these shields belonged to them. And as it turned out, the Navajo had absolutely the most re revealing and 
clearly the most truthful claim. A lot of the tribes simply said, we used to live there, they must be ours. But the Navajo consulted with a medicine man by the name of John Holliday, who had grown up in Monument Valley, and his grandmother actually ran sheep in the Capitol Reef area. And oral history had brought down to him the story of the shields. And not only did he know what they were, they, he knew who made them. And I'm going to read you a paragraph from Bob McPherson's piece about the shields. Uh, John Holliday said, many goats with white hair created the shields, making them in the Kaibab Mountains in a thick pine forest with a circular clearing. Custody of the shields went from person to person, from medicine man to medicine man, first to man who keeps his mouth open, then yellow forehead, tall skinny man, man who wants to sit down, side person, man who plays with the wooden cards, man with metal teeth, ropey, and finally to little bitter water man. John Holliday knew the names of the shields, Earth's protective shield, Heaven's protective shield. And he went on to say that ropey and bitter, little bitter water man had custody of the shields in the middle 1800s when Kit Carson and the US Cavalry began to round up Navajo people and force them to leave their homes and go on the long walk to Eastern New Mexico. And so the two medicine men decided they better hide the shields to protect them. And they buried them in a cave along the red rock cliffs of Capitol Reef. But alas, they left the area and became sick and died before they told anyone where they were. And so it took a few more decades before the bishop rediscovered them. And a few more decades after that, before John Holliday had the, the opportunity to explain all this to the Park Service, who repatriated the shields to the Navajo people. And today they live in the Navajo Tribal Museum in Window Rock, Arizona, where they are used by today's medicine people. I just think that's an amazing story and wanted to share it with you. So when I say Capitol Reef, what do I mean? It's a big piece of country. Here's a regional map all the way from Denver over here to Salt Lake City. And here around the four corners, you can see all of the canyons of the Colorado Plateau, all of the protected areas, arches and canyon lands over by Moab, Zion and Bryce over here by St. George, Grand Staircase, Bears Ears, and then inside this red box in a pretty remote part of Utah is Capitol Reef Country. I still love this map that was in my 1978 booklet even though it shows the road over Boulder Mountain as still dirt and Notum Road and the Bird Trail as all dirt roads. But I really think it brings to, to life the geography of the country that I include in the reader. Capitol Reef is the zigzag white line that is pretty arbitrary, following the golden water pocket fold, these, these cliffs of a wrinkle in the Earth's surface that run from almost 100 miles from Thousand Lake Mountain in the north all the way down to the Colorado River. And in between are the canyons that you see when you look out from the rim of Boulder Mountain to the east toward the jagged summits of the Henry Mountains over here on the eastern edge of Capitol Reef Country. And then at the very far north of the park, beyond the water pocket fold, are these dry valleys of South Desert and Cathedral Valley that are so different from the rest of the park. Capitol Reef literature begins on that rim of Boulder Mountain, looking out to the east over the park. And Capitol Reef literature really begins when Clarence Dutton looked out over that view in 1880, waxing eloquent as he gazed over the water pocket fold, sent here by John Wesley Powell as a geologist to study geology, but finding himself bowled over by what he called the sublime panorama, the superlative desert, the same view that in 1960 Wallace Stegner would contemplate when he thought about wilderness and defined this country as the geography of hope. I went looking for other less famous writers as well who had looked out over that view, and I found Michigan writer Linda Elizabeth Peterson's essay, where she writes movingly of being undone by the view from Boulder Mountain. In that far north corner of the park, South Desert and Cathedral Valley, are so different from the rest of the park. And the most interesting pieces I found about Cathedral Valley had to do with photographs. Back in 1854, Solomon Carvalho came through 
as photographer for the John Charles Fremont expedition and took what we think is the very first photograph ever taken in, in uh, Capitol Reef. This etching is based on that photograph. Many years later, the contemporary photographer, Bob Schler, taught himself how to make daguerreotypes using the same equipment and went back to Cathedral Valley to match the Carvalho photograph with his modern version of these monoliths that today we call Mom, Pop, and Henry. I also include Carvalho's own harrowing account of nearly freezing to death on that expedition through the park to be, an excerpt from his 1860 bestseller, the only account we have of Fremont's 1854 expedition. Even though this is surely the least visited section of the park, the temples of the sun and moon in Cathedral Valley have become the iconic images of Capitol Reef. I think because of their easily grasped monumentality, because of their graphic boldness. This is surely why when you see one of those RVs that travelers have rented with a, pho a photograph painted on the side of one of our Western national parks, for Capitol Reef, they use the Temple of the Sun and the Temple of the Moon. I reached out to more modern writers, more modern than Carvalho certainly, and found my way to Ann Whitaker, a younger writer in Salt Lake City, who turned loose to me the letter that she wrote to her grandfather, acknowledging the power and balm of Cathedral Valley, where her grandfather uses the valley as a refuge to retreat to, to heal from the PTSD he suffers from World War II. So Capitol Reef turns out to have a surprisingly rich literature, and it just keeps going. It's a living literature with a lot of these writers repeating the word love, a word to describe how they feel about this place. The editors of the Arches and Bryce Canyon volumes in this National Park Reader series are having a hard time finding the same wealth of writing. And I think I figured out the reason. Capitol Reef was named because the, the pioneers found those big cliffs a barrier to travel, sort of like an ocean reef. But it turns out to be more passageway than barrier. Archers and Bryce perch by themselves in their spectacular locations off the beaten path. Here, native people use the permanent streams running through the fold as home and as trails for thousands of years, for 12,000 years, as a matter of fact, leaving behind cultural traces and stories. Explorers looked out from Boulder Mountain and then worked their way through the fold along the streams or through the open draws of Cathedral Valley, journaling all the way. We go to these same pathways for our hikes. And the only road across Southern and Central Utah for years came right through Capitol Gorge for nearly a century until 1963 when the Fremont Canyon Highway replaced it with another through route. All of these travels, all of these through routes brought travelers. And there were often writers in those vehicles. And both residents and visiting writers cherished the little village of Fruta that that highway brought them to. A little tiny place with big personalities. Old Timers and Fruta self-published their nostalgic memories of both the pioneer Mormon settlers and the one-room schoolhouse. And this gave me a rich body of literature to excerpt. This included a few eccentric mis misfits as well who retired here in the 40s. I guess we have to admit, we still attract eccentric misfits to Wayne County and Garfield County. All of this makes for a lot of choices for the editor of a Capital Reef anthology. Fruta still generates both fruit and fresh writing from younger writers like Jen Jackson Quintano, who writes of the 26 mason jars of sun-soaked Fruta apricots stored under her bed, as she puts it, jeweled jars of memory. One of my favorites of those reminiscences of Fruta comes from a writer named Rennie Russell. And those of you who might be as old as me might recognize this spread. On the right, you'll see the calligraphed words, adventure is not in the guidebook and beauty is not on the map. Seek and ye shall find. Well, I pretty much have those words memorized because the, they come from a book called On the Loose by Terry and Rennie Russell, published back in 1967, a, a book that was really important to me as a, a young guy in college discovering the wilderness of the West. The book was one of the first Sierra Club books to, to introduce us to Western wildlands we might not know a lot about. And the two brothers as young men 
had spent a lot of time in the Glen Canyon area and in Capitol Reef and the Mojave Desert and put together this lovely book of quotes and ponderings and, as they put it, cheap dime store prints of their photographs that meant a lot to young people like me. Rennie published a book 40 years later called Rock Me on the Water, looking back at the summer of 1958, when he and his brother Terry spent the summer in Fruta, hanging out with their aunt and uncle who lived here, and with some of those eccentrics I mentioned, like Doc Inglesby, a retired dentist from Salt Lake, a favorite friend of Wallace Stegner, who ran a funky little motel in Fruta and collected big chunks of petrified wood from the backcountry. Rennie writes about spending the summer there, riding horses down the Fremont Canyon, being caught in, not in flash floods, but being witness to flash floods along the Fremont River, bringing what he described as flood water, filthy with desire and urgency. Other places where I worked, where I looked, excuse me, for books, included the bookshelves down at the Park Library. And I found an obscure 1986 Utah State University master's thesis in history on those bookshelves that I had not discovered anywhere else. A thesis that was titled Capitol Reef, the Forgotten National Park. Well, it turned out to be really well written by a guy named Jonathan Thow, T-H-O-W. And he'd done a superb job narrating the park's history. So I wanted to use a couple of excerpts from his work to tell the story of that history. But I needed his permission and I had the, the most trouble finding him of any writer in the book. Jonathan Thau had not stayed in academia, so he was not easily visible on the web. The university had no contact information for him. And after much detective work over a couple of years, I finally found him on the web. He's now a US, US Navy judge advocate, an international law expert, and a commanding officer of the Naval Justice School in Newport, Rhode Island. So I called up the Naval Justice School and got that recorded message saying, punch in the first three letters of the person you're trying to reach. And I did that and I, by God, I got his voicemail and he called me back and was delighted to have this relic from his past see print. There's controversy in this history of Capitol Reef and I've not shied away from these stories. When Bishop Pechtel and his brother-in-law, Joseph Hickman, pushed for a Wayne Wonderland National Park to boost the Wayne County economy, what they got in 1937 was a relatively small Capitol Reef National Monument that remained unfunded for decades and was even open to uranium mining in the 1950s. When Park Superintendent Bob Hyder drew boundaries to expand that small monument sixfold in 1968, he asked his wife to secretly type up his proposal because his secretary down at the park was Afton Taylor wife of Wayne County rancher Don Taylor, who happened to be the president of the Wayne County Cattlemen's Association. And Hyder didn't want to blow his cover with locals who might not approve of expanding the park so drastically. President Lyndon Johnson believed in that proposal that was conveyed to him by Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall. And Lyndon Johnson made that map real when he signed an executive order, actually while dressing for Richard Nixon's inauguration, he pretty much signed the, the executive order while he was putting on his pants for the inauguration ceremony. Here in Southern Utah, not everyone was pleased. Boulder Town over the mountain briefly changed its name to Johnson's Folly in protest. Nonetheless, within two years, Congress made Capitol Reef a national park and the water pocket fold was protected for the first time all the way south to Halls Creek Narrows. Today, 1.3 million visitors come to Capitol Reef National Park in a single year. Another spot in the park that's been a source of controversy over the years is the Burr Trail, the dirt road that winds in switchbacks right over the top of the water pocket fold and then on, taken as a dirt road back in the, in the time when I photographed this aerial, now paved from the park boundary through the Circle Cliffs and Grand, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument and over to the town of Boulder, below Boulder Mountain. Ever since the, the uh, sheep men and then the uranium prospectors created this route, the local counties have wanted to pave it to make it easier for visitors and bring more people to this place. 
the conservation community has wanted to keep it a dirt road for that backcountry adventure feeling when you drive up the dirt road switchbacks and right in the heart of the water pocket fold, look at these amazing views. The counties over the years have gone out and done renegade paving, illegal paving really. And over the years they've been sued and it goes on and on right up until recently. Along the way, there was a little bit of graffiti left on the, the bridge abutment at the gulch on the Burr Trail between Boulder and the park. And in the reader, Jared Farmer is telling these stories and actually mentions this little bit of graffiti. And when I read that in his piece, I thought, you know, I think I have a photograph of that very same graffiti buried in my files. And I absolutely dug around and finally found it and was able to include an illustration of the very phrase that, that he had noticed a very long time ago. All of this history is in the reader. All of this informs our lives still. I also found waiting for me on those shelves in the Park Library, the oral histories collected by Brad Fry in the 1990s when he worked on an administrative history of the park. Brad had interviewed Billy Bullard and Lert Nee, consecutive owners of the ranch on Pleasant Creek through most of the 20th century. I had interviewed both of these storytellers as well, so I was able to create standalone pieces combining stories and transcripts from both mine and Brad Fry's conversations. And both Billy and Lert were terrific storytellers. And as I did this, I realized I could build on these pieces and tell the story of that single spot, that ranch on Pleasant Creek, all the way through the generations. From F. Hanks, who came to the spot in 1881 and built Floral Ranch, where the Fremont had farmed as well, through Billy and Lert, to Chip and Linda Ward, who ran Lert's Sleeping Rainbow Guest Ranch in the 1970s. And then when I gave a talk at Utah Valley University, I met Kiri Manukin, who ran writing workshops for the UVU Field Station that now stands on the spot of the guest ranch. And Kiri enthusiastically shared work from her students, from three awestruck international students from the Ukraine, Saudi Arabia, and Mali, who were trying to make sense of Capitol Reef as wide-eyed first-timers and English language learners. This progression of pieces about the same spot on Pleasant Creek in the park span nearly 40 years. And that sequence is one of my favorites in the book. Wayne County nourishes its own community of resident creative folk. Everyone from artists and painters and photographers to cowboy poets. This photograph is actually great fun. Uh, the first time I, I projected it in the book launch at the little Entrada Institute here in Torrey, Dick Pace was in the audience. Dick Pace is a local rancher. He came over to me at the end of the talk and said, how'd you get that picture of me? And it turns out that I photographed a cattle drive along the scenic drive in, in the park in 1975 without knowing the name of the cowboy on that horse, but it turns out it was Dick, who still runs his cows in the, in the region. And he made a point of telling me that the name of the horse is Cheese. Uh, I, I love this chance to include a cowboy poem in the reader from our poet laureate, Ray Conrad, illustrating with a photograph of another regional rancher, a charming guy named Dwight Williams. I was able to include other local folks, a hiking narrative from Red Rock Adventure Guide, Steve Howe, an essay by Chip Ward. And I decided to write a quick survey of artists in Capitol Reef, which gave me a chance to include a photograph by Guy Tal, who lives in Torrey, and a painting by Doug Snow, who lived in Wayne County for many years and created beautiful abstract paintings of the landscape. And so I went ahead and, and created a little section of the book called Capitol Reef Illustrated and included some of the great pieces of art that come from the park. This black and white photograph by Bruce Barnbaum. And perhaps my favorite, this, this photograph, Moonrise Over Pie Pan by John Fall. Uh, really interesting photographer who sadly just died a week or two ago. And I recommend a, a, just a lovely obituary written about him and his work in the New York Times. I was also able to highlight the great conservation photographers of the 1960s and 1970s. Philip Hyde, who photographed for a Sierra Club book called Slick Rock, taking pictures in Capitol Reef and the Escalante, text by Edward Abbey. And Elliot Porter, 
another photographer for the Great Sierra Club conservation books, who came through Capitol Reef the summer I was a ranger here. And I was thrilled to have one of my heroes show up at the visitor center and ask for advice from a young whippersnapper of a ranger for good places to take pictures. I sent Elliot Porter off to Fountain Tanks in the southern part of the park. And when the book was finally published, American Places, with photographs by Elliot Porter, text by Wallace Stegner, I was thrilled to see a picture of Fountain Tanks and was convinced he took the picture because I sent him there. But when we got permission to use the picture in the reader, the caption said 1963. I'm still convinced that's a mistake. I think this is the picture that Elliot Porter took the day that I sent him to Fountain Tanks. James Swenson teaches the history of photography at BYU, and he's particularly interested in Minor White's work and wrote a piece for the reader, an original piece that he called Capitol Reef's most famous photograph. This photograph by Minor White turns up in book after book about art history and the history of 20th century photography. It's an abstract black and white of a detail of Moen Kopi sandstone, maybe a span of about three feet of that wall. I keep having, uh, keep, keep, I keep my eye out for it as I hike in the park, but I haven't seen it yet. But uh, James writes in detail about this very interesting photograph. I've realized the first question I get about the reader is, how did I find all this cool material, work from nearly 50 writers? I've told you a little bit about that already. My bedrock for building the reader is the stuff I read when I first read, when I first came here, when I first arrived here. Uh, some of the names I've already used, Clarence Dutton of the Powell Survey and Wallace Stegner and Edward Abbey. My other starting point, the bookshelf, the bookshelf of works published by the Capitol Reef Natural History Association over the years. I also asked fellow writers, scholars, regional experts for advice. I asked them for leads. Did they have anything to suggest? What would they include? I'm a natural history writer, and so I could look through the work of my friends and colleagues to find great writing about Capitol Reef. Amazon.com turns out to be a great research tool as well. The company may be taking over the world, but they are thorough. Maybe that's why they're taking over the world. I searched for books on the Amazon website using every keyword I could think of. Capitol Reef, Water Pocket Fold, Fruta, Wayne County, Boulder Mountain, Fremont River. You get the idea. And in my searching, I found all kinds of things I did not find elsewhere. Self-published books, obscure books, out of print books. I found Gary Ferguson's book, Shouting at the Sky, based on time he spent around Capitol Reef with kids enrolled in the Aspen Institute's Wilderness Therapy Program. Gary Ferguson described his field work for that book as the most significant personal experience I've ever had. His, his description of a night in the red desert is one of my favorite passages in the reader. He writes, the full moon spilling down the shoulders of Caneville Reef across the long flat sweeps of sage and rabbit brush and greasewood through a thin braid of dry nameless washes onto the faces of seven teenage girls scattered across the ground at the edge of a box canyon, hoping for sleep. To illustrate Gary's piece about being out there with those Aspen Institute kids, I went out to photograph that same full moon spilling across the red desert late one summer night. And I have to say it was absolutely exhilarating to be out there alone in the middle of nowhere, the desert bright by moonlight under a canopy of stars. I was determined to include Ellen Malloy, Utah's best writer, who died much too soon in 2004. When Ellen walked along the Navajo sandstone spine of Comb Ridge outside her home in Bluff and wrote about the slick radica of Indian paintbrush and cliff rose in spring, she could just as easily have been writing about the Navajo sandstone spine of the water pocket fold. So I was able to use her smart, funny, and gorgeous writing. I skimmed each new book to find passages to excerpt, scan those new pages, and plot the new piece on my pile. I shuffled these into themes. I had to eliminate some, go back to searching for others to fill gaps, shorten many. Nearly every author proved generous and cooperative. The highest reprint fees came from publishers and agents managing the legacies of deceased authors, where I had no chance to plead nonprofit publisher poverty with the writer herself. 
At the same time, the book pushed me into organizing my thousands of photos from the park taken over these past decades. Once I had all those slides pulled together, all those digital images in their place on my hard drives, I began editing, choosing not just my favorites, but images I knew would best illustrate the excerpts. But I searched the files at the park at the Utah Historical Society and at Marriott Library and the University of Utah for maps and historic images. And note on this map from the Wheeler survey, this caption, impracticable ridges, George Wheeler's name for the water pocket fold. Some of my pictures really didn't fit into illustration, but they were pictures I wanted to include. And so I created a portfolio section that I could, where I could feature a few photos that one might call art, details and landscapes that are more pure, pure graphic and light than illustration. And I always begin any portfolio of my pictures from Capitol Reef with this picture of the castle and this quote from Willa Cather, because I think this is the bright edge of the world and no other quote quite captures it in the same way. So in this little portfolio, I included pictures that didn't really illustrate other people's work, reflections, simply playing in the landscape, running along the spine of Manka Shale, Juniper Snags, details. As with any book, once I had a draft, I gave the manuscript to friends and colleagues for review. The park superintendent, local historians, smart friends, the general editors of the series, of course, all gave me invaluable advice. And I used my prerogative as editor to close the reader with my own words. I chose an excerpt from the last chapter in my book, Bargaining for Eden, where I do my best to figure out Wayne County, this classic small town, long winter, droughty summer Western challenge. I end both the reader and bargaining for Eden with a credo. I wrote this piece more than a decade ago when I tried to boil down into a bulleted list what I believe about land, community, and honor after 50 odd years of living in the Imperial West and learning from the past, from my mentors, from the stories of impassioned advocates on all sides, from the desert, from the mesa, from the canyons. A statement too of my dreams for the future. You'll have to judge when you get a hold of the reader yourself if I've done so fairly. So I hope the Capital Reef Reader serves as a primer to this place so many of us love, an introduction to an incredibly rich literature created over many decades, a celebration of our home. Thank you. So I'm going to go back now out of screen sharing. And back to the screen where you can see me. I have to turn on the video. And Christoph is going to bring us back to some questions. Wow. Um... What a, what a guide. How wonderful that was. That, okay, I'm in the car. I'm out of here. I'm Thank you. Down. <laughs> okay, let, let me know when you get here. All right, we, we just had, so we had practically throughout the entire thing, zero attrition. Nobody left the room. Um, uh, we have one uh, question, actually, um, and so I'll get right to it. I'll see if I just read it out to you, okay? Uh, this is from Anthony with so much writing and art that came from periods of, so, um, of solitude and exploring the unknown, do you feel current and future writings and human experiences will lack some of the emotions and revelations that history bestowed on those less connected in the past? What a great question, and, and so well written. Yeah. Uh, I, More I, questions I, are coming in, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to this one. Okay. No, I, I think we're, we're gonna to continue to see glorious writing and artistic responses to this landscape. Um, you know, Capitol Reef has a, a main road going right through the narrow waste of the park and a scenic drive that can be pretty crowded. You know, Memorial Day weekend, the Hickman Bridge Trail uh, parking lot will be full with overflow onto the highway. But if you walk a little bit off those des designated trails, if you go off into the back country, it's still very easy to be by yourself, to find that solitude that you're talking about. And all of us are 
people that want to articulate what we see. We want to pull out a journal. We want to take pictures, especially with all of us with our phones in our pockets and access to social media want to share those photographs. And so I, I fully expect to see glorious work coming out of the park, this park, other parks, all of the public lands that we so desperately need to preserve as we move into a future with more and more people. But I think there'll be places in the canyons and certainly places out in the West Desert of the Great Basin where we can find solitude and contemplate our relationship to the earth. Um, it's gonna be a different kind of earth with, with climate change, but there will be open places for us still. Awesome. Um, a little bit more of a practical question really quick. Uh, Linda is saying, uh, my husband can no longer hike, but loves photographing. Can we see enough from driving through Capitol Reef? I think you just mentioned that a little bit. So go speak to that. No, absolutely. Um, you know, right now during the pandemic, the front country is closed, the scenic drive is closed, but that won't be forever. And in Capitol Reef, when you drive down the scenic drive, you can drive right into Capitol Gorge and Grand Wash, those deep canyons. Capitol Gorge is, is the, the route that the highway used to follow. There was that picture of the old cars in Capitol Gorge. Actually, it's also in the poster behind me. And uh, you really feel like you're driving right into the earth. And there are many places along there where you can take remarkable photographs and have actually remarkable experiences just off the highway. So um, absolutely, there are many things you can do and a, and a couple of paved trails even where you can uh, get access to the petroglyphs and the rock art and still really understand a little bit more about what Capitol Reef's all about, even without taking long walks. Mark had also a question, where can we buy this? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I, I would like to say every bookstore. I don't know that every bookstore has it. I know uh, in Salt Lake City, the local independents, the King's English, Ken Sanders, Weller Bookworks would all have it. Uh, you can buy it at the Museum of Natural History on campus, which I believe is currently closed. <laughs> um, you can certainly order it online from Amazon or from the University of Utah Press. There are a couple of links on my website, uh, stephentrimble.net. And eventually, when the park back opens back up and the visitor center is open, you can buy it there. And also at, at a couple of outlets here in Torrey, the old house at Center in Maine. Right. Um, a good question here from, um, from Sharon, and I hope I pronounced this uh, author's name correctly. Anything from Everett Roos related to Capitol Reef? Uh, I love Everett Roos. Um, Everett Roos was the young man who disappeared in the 30s into the canyons over in the Escalante and was never found and uh, is one of the great romantic mysteries of canyon country. Everett never came through Capitol Reef and so I did not include him. Um, if he did come through Capitol Reef, he didn't write about it, but his writing is really centered on the Navajo Reservation and the country south of here along with the Escalante. So it's a great story, but um, there were people that we know as, as wonderful writers about Southern Utah, Terry, Terry Tempest Williams, for one, who just never wrote about Capitol Reef. So uh, you'll find their work in other places, but not, not here. If she's in this webinar, go get down there, Terry. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, Jan is asking, in your research, did you find quite a bit of history about early settlers? If so, uh, will you consider writing about them? Uh, I found a lot of history, um, not a lot of writing that I could include in the book until people really began living in, in Fruta. You know, the, um, the Fremont expedition came through in the 1850s. The first Mormon militia expeditions chasing after the Ute and Paiute people who had started to, a little war to try to reclaim the lands that had been taken from them in the 1860s. Uh, the Powell expedition in the 1870s, the Mormon pioneers beginning to colonize in the 1880s. The, um, the writing I've done in some of my other books and the introductions in, in all of the pieces in here is probably what, what I'll do with that. I do have a novel that takes place down here that would include uh, sort of fiction, fiction versions of some of that. But uh, the novel is, is not finished and not published. Soon? A lot of work. 
<laughs> I, but I do plan to get back to it. Um, Tina is, um, and, and uh, Jerry will, and Jerry are asking, is there a DVD that accompanies the book or a companion KVD program on Capitol Reef? Uh, this has been spectacular. Thank you, she writes. Well, you're welcome. Uh, all the photographs you saw are in the book. The University of Utah Press, I imagine, will be doing an, an e-version of the book uh, that you could read on your, you know, iPad or Kindle or such. Um, I think Go Learn is planning to record this and post it on YouTube or some such place, so you'd be able to see it again. But beyond that, there's there's nothing. I really do love books, and books are still the primary product I'm trying to create. We had also, um, this is obviously going straight to you, Stephen, a few shout outs. We had Linda, thanks, super session today. Uh, Amy, head of the Tory this week. Is your book available there? You know, so many places are closed. I think the Capitol Reef Inn in Tory is open and they have a little bookstore. They carry it there. As far as I know, that's the only place that's open that has the book. Um, Everything else is still closed. I'm reading out another shout out from Branda. Uh, can we applaud Steve? Um, huge applause. I'm in the car now as well. <laughs> <laughs> Smiley face. Yes. Um, well, I think as uh, Anne is writing, um, this this area was the first place that I saw jewels hanging from the night sky. Thank you. Um, I, I think she's talking about the spectacular night uh, dark skies that we have in southern Utah, and especially in the water pocket fold where there's no other light source around. Yeah, Capitol Reef is a dark sky park, official recognition. The little town of Torrey is a dark sky community. And um, we're all pretty careful about, you know, keeping the lights around our homes dim, pointing down, the street lights in Torrey point down. It, it's an amazing place for dark night skies. And you, you pretty much are guaranteed of seeing the Milky Way when it's above the horizon on any cloudless night. I so I encourage you to do what I did and drive out in the middle of nowhere or camp in the middle of nowhere and be there on a full moon night. And uh, you could pretty much read, read the reader by the light of the full moon and uh, glory in those skies they're they're thrilling and as we know they're they're more and more rare there are so many people who live in cities who have never seen the milky way and so the skies are very much a part of the experience here and a great spot to propose to your future wife <laughs> you know I, I i meant to tell you christoph um my wife and i with some friends and our kids were hiking in cohab canyon years ago and I wanted to go off in a little side canyon alcove where I used to take people on nature walks when I was a ranger. And we discovered a friend of ours writing his wedding vows with his new wife in that little alcove. Uh, it's a great place for those moments. Yep. And I think it's because those, especially the alcoves, feel so intimate. You, you really feel like you're secreted away from the world in your own little spot. Great place for proposals, great place for special moments. Okay, I, uh, uh, Charles is having another question. How did Fruta residents learn that federal agents were coming so that they could scramble up into the canyon? National Park staff didn't have an answer. Um, I actually have a piece in the, in the reader written by F. Hanks, uh, one of F. Hanks' sons and I think nephews, telling the story of, of um, how they hid polygamist at uh, Floral Ranch when the federal agents would come. And it's hard to know how fictionalized the story is, but there was a sequence, there were basically a sequence of lookouts. They would post one of the kids when they'd be, you know, they would usually hear a rumor that someone was coming. And they'd post one of the kids who would race and let a wagon go across the road to slow them down. And there was a sequence of barriers they would create to give the polygamous time to hide. And um, Cohab Canyon above the campground named after cohabitation, got its name because that was one of the places that polygamists would hide back in the day before polygamy became illegal and was no longer practiced by, by local families. I did not know. 
But they're also, I have to say, they're also uh, stills hidden away as well. The, the Mormon families who lived here lived in enough isolation that they uh, did not necessarily follow all of the rules and were well known for moonshine as well. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we have a few more questions here. Um, um, the, the, um, I guess more of a comment from, um, is it Eunice, I think? With less traffic and pollution thanks to the coronavirus, are the skies even more vivid? And can you see the stars more vividly even? It's kind of hard to imagine it, that they could be even more vivid, but um, you know, May and June tend to be really windy. And we've had incredible clouds of pollen blowing out of the junipers. And so the, um, right now, it's not necessarily the very, very best time to see those skies. Winter is great, and later in the summer when we get afternoon thunder showers in July and August, kind of washing the, the, the skies clean every afternoon are even better. But this is one place where regional haze isn't quite the same problem as it is in places uh, like the Grand Canyon. And so our skies tend to be pretty clear most of the time, but it's absolutely true. You know, right now we've got clear skies all over the world. I just noticed this morning the greenhouse gases went down 17% over the last month, emissions, which is unheard of. So maybe we can preserve some of this in, uh, in the future, now that we can see the sky in places like Shanghai and, and um, Beijing. And New Delhi. I, I saw on PBS News, uh, New Delhi the other day, unheard of clear um, uh, air that the New Delhi residents are like, whoa, is this my city? Yeah. Um, another a little qu uh, practical question again, um, I guess that just goes down to this park in particular. Um, um, uh, to see the Milky Way is the full moon night, is a full moon night better? And I think we all kind of know the answer, but uh, go ahead, Steve. When, when, when is the best uh, time to see the Milky Way? Obviously at night. Yeah, and the, the best way is actually um, the new moon, when there's no moon at all. But it's, it's, if you're interested in photographing, it's actually great fun to photograph closer to the full moon when you have some light on the landscape. And the, the skies are so clear here with a long exposure, you still see the Milky Way up there, but um, the landscape is lit up instead of just black. And um, you don't have to worry about trying to light it up with a flashlight or your headlights or a headlamp or some such thing. So both, both ways work. Both ways are spectacular. Um, camping under full moon in the desert is, it's as if it's daylight. You, you, it's, it's magic, it's really magic. And you know, the landscapes look very, very different. It come, uh, the earth gives off a whole different, um, I don't know, radiation of sorts. Hey, I'm toggling between two things, uh, the chat and questions and answers. So let me get back to question and answer. Uh, more questions came in, so this is good. Uh, somebody would just like to say hi to you, Steve. It's Mike Doubleday. Great presentation. So clearly someone you know. Old uh, friend from college who lives in Washington State. What's that? He's an old friend from college who lives in Washington State. Yay. Good. Um, we love when people join us from, from out of Utah. Um, he also writes, any favorite hikes in the park you could share? Well, some of them are secret, obviously. <laughs> uh, one place that I would recommend that is just a little bit off the beaten path, the Chimney Rock Trail is well marked and, and highly traveled. And on the back side of Chimney Rock, there's a canyon that go, goes back into the fold, leading to Spring Canyon, which is a longer hike. But that's a great place to find yourself in a deep canyon really quickly. It's, it's a place to get a feel for the backcountry if you leave the Chimney Rock Loop and go down Chimney Rock Canyon a ways, you're in the back country instantly. And that, that's one place I would recommend. I keep notes. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see, uh, we got, uh, so that was that question. Uh, Charles, um, I think we answered that one. Um, Cohab Canyon near Fruta, how did Fruta residents learn? We, we talked about that one. Sandra is writing, great job, Steve. Hope to be hiking with you soon. Mike and Sandy. So um, Great. I think you know who they are, so I don't need to say their last names. That's right. 
Okay, Lee, um, my, my family were in Utah early. My uncle was one room, I think one room teacher, he's uh, writing in Bicknell in 1920. Cool. Does that all ring a bell? Yeah, that's very cool. So yeah, that's, that's Lee um, writing to us. Let's see. Um, Jane, my, f my favorite other trip leader who's coming in two days. Jane England is writing brilliant. Uh, this will be har a hard act to follow, she said. <laughs> so for those who are still here with us, um, join us on Thursday for another one of these with uh, Tim Slover and Jane England. Uh, we are going to London, so that's in two days on, at noon. Let's see, Gre uh, Gre Craig is, is writing, um, thanks for the workshop. Capitol Reef is one of my favorite parks in the world. Um, Uh, thank you for attending. Da, da. Um, you know, Jane also writes, our photos aren't quite as gorgeous. Oh, come on. Um, I think, let's see, I need to scroll here. Okay. Um, don't answer if you don't have time, but we do have time. Will this be posted on YouTube? Yes, we are recording it. This will go on YouTube. Um, and I think we can wrap this up. We have, uh, wait, one more. There's actually two more coming in on the, on the questions. So let's see. Spencer, outside of the current shutdowns, I think I have seen great increase lately on national park tourism. It's great to see Americans take advantage of national park um, initiative, which grants each of us ownership of these marvelous areas. However, certainly in the increased traffic comes, uh, Certainly the increased traffic comes with its consequences when it comes to a preserved natural area. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, you know, a lot of the increase in national park visitation here in Utah goes right back to the Mighty Five campaign by the travel, the Office of Tourism and the governor's office that started in 2013. Uh, capital Reef visitation doubled after that. And, um, the both the office of tourism which has kind of recognized that they created some problems and the park service and other federal lands management agencies encourage us all to go beyond the parks you know basically all of southern utah could be one big national park and it was pretty much proposed that way in the 1930s so go to grand staircase escalante and speak up to restore grand, Sta grand staircase to its original boundaries Go to Bears Ears and learn about the native people that are cooperatively managing and in, in, in probably in a better way when we restore those monument boundaries as well. We'll be able to far better uh, cooperatively manage that land of, of their ancestors. You know, there's a lot of very interesting country and remarkable stories and glorious landscape outside the national parks. It's, it's a national park uh, level scenery, quality scenery pretty much when you uh, hit the 100th meridian and drive all the way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, you can go anywhere. And so much of it is public land, Bureau of Land Management land that is open to all of us, owned jointly by all of us. And we are so spoiled and so privileged to live in the West yeah. and have access to that land so easily and be able to camp without a permit in so many places and be there, as we talked about, for the Milky Way and for photographing and wandering and exploring with our kids. So um, we, we, can't, we can't keep the, the people back. You know, we're gonna have more and more people in every community in the country. And we, we want them to get outside. We want them to experience the, the natural world and play matchmaker with their kids and make that connection for their children. But you don't have to go to a national park. You don't have to go to the most crowded scenic view at the Grand Canyon to do that, you can um, easily get into open country and have remarkable experiences. And that's the solution. Got us to one of our last questions here uh, from Haley. Any recommendations on places just outside of the National Park where I could camp remotely with my dogs? <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, I don't, I don't want to get too specific, but the, it's that BLM land. So look for the dirt roads off of the main road, just outside of any of these developed areas. Um, as we say in my family, it, 
your, your best camping place is going to be a dirt road off a dirt road off a dirt road. <laughs> and, uh, and you can get to most of those places without fancy four wheel drive. Just make sure that you don't pioneer new tracks, protect yeah. biological soil crust, you know, know the rules for minimal impact. Yeah, that's, that is important. Um, but yes, uh, a, a topographical map of the region that you're in should indicate where BLM is and what possibly could be a private property so you don't trespass. And, and most of these community, most gateway communities to national parks will have a, uh, a visitor center for local information that will give you more specific ideas. And if, uh, uh, if Craig is still out there, um, he has worked with uh, some of the larger parks on sustainability and he's got us a whole list of, of things that he's done. I will, uh, Craig, if you're still out there, I will, sh I will share this list, um, obviously, with, uh, um, with Stephen, and he will, he will get all that information. Uh, it's a little long-running list right now for us to conclude this uh, webinar. Um, I'd like to visit Tori um, um, in time and chat. So uh, I think, uh, Craig, uh, I, I can always get you in touch with Stephen uh, when you visit uh, Tori, and he happens to be down there. Um, and then uh, Spencer writes, great response, insightful and unexpected. Uh, thank you. That, that was to a earlier question from, from, from him. So I think we're, uh, we're good. We still have like 57 people there, like uh, over half the people that we, we were allowed to have by this webinar. We're only allowed to have 100. We had to go on Facebook Live. Um, and um, what a great tour guide for us here at home. Um, I, I do know some of them already ordered your book, and um, it's a great read, and it makes me really excited for going down to Capitol Reef and uh, explore once again uh, that monument that some people, some might bypass for bigger, lower hanging fruit. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, thanks everybody who's participated here at Continuing Education. And um, hopefully we're all gonna travel soon again. And hopefully this uh, whole uh, pandemic will remind us on what impactful travel should look like. What sustainability uh, in travel and in visiting places should look like. And how we as the traveler have an impact on places. We mentioned this here earlier. No matter where we go, wherever we spend our money, I think we need to be thoughtful about this, especially in the future, whether it's for our earth or whether it's also just we need to learn and not just consume. I, I agree. And make sure that you speak up for those places that you love. Don't, don't keep it to yourself. But when they, are, when they are endangered, speak up. So thank you all. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for this. Everybody, have fun out there and be safe, okay? Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.